And I've been doing network analysis work with organizations for about 10, 15 years now. And I came to this work um, through a mentor, Karen Stevenson. And at that point, so my background is in organization development and change. And in organization development, we talk a lot, or at least we talked a lot then about the informal system and that there's a formal system of an organizational structure, but there's also this informal system that has a lot to do with how the organization behaves and performs and what it's like to work in the organization. And what network analysis gave me is a tool that helped illuminate that informal network. So I think what I've been asked to do here is speak for about 20 minutes. Is that about right? 20 minutes and then um, open up to a conversation? Yeah, okay. I mean, 20, 20, 30 minutes, make sure to cover it. The, the space is yours. Uh, we always love discussing and we'll take as much time as that as possible, but make sure you have enough time to explain your topic properly. Great. So then uh, what I, I'm going to do is I'm going to share some slides uh, because, as you know, network analysis is visual. So it's helpful to have some visuals as we go. Uh, so you've already heard a little bit about my background. And what I'd like to do today is just broaden your you know, exposure to how ONA can be used within organizations, practical applications. And it sounds like we do have quite a bit of experience in the room, people who've been thinking about things like organizational design and user experience. So things that are very much connected uh, to ONA. But I'm going to share a little bit around some practical in the trenches, what does it look like? And we'll look at two organizations and how they applied network analysis. So. Uh, I will talk for you know a little bit. There's a few points in here where we can stop um, and do a pause for uh, questions, reflections. Feel free to jump in if there's something that doesn't make sense along the way. So the first situation I'm going to share, uh, this was the uh, Bayer Crop Science um, client. So worked with them for several years. They were, you know, really interesting organization. At the time I worked with them, they had offices really all over the globe. So all these little dots are all of their outposts. But what they were is they were an organization that was very siloed. So they worked regionally in their regions. They did not work as a concerted whole. And what happened is there was often redundancy. So the Singapore office would see an issue, they would start to do work. And then a few months later, the Sao Paulo office uh, would come up with the same issue and start to address it, not knowing that their colleagues in Singapore had already done a lot of the work. So a new leader had come into this particular division and said, we have to do things better. So here's what we did. We started with a launch workshop. So this was in person in Washington, DC. There were over 50 people from around the globe. And this was an introduction to what's a network? Why do we care about networks? And one of the most striking things we did is we actually asked them to create in the room their network. So they got up, they stood, and they moved themselves in space uh, in order to uh, depict their impression of the network. Uh, and then what we did is ask them to remember that because we followed it up with a formal network analysis. And I'm not gonna get into too many of the details, just you know, let it be known that there was a lot of work that needed to be done to make this work cross-culturally uh, according to the norms of different countries. We needed to pay a lot of attention to language. And so this was a joint design process. So there was a group of employees that were helping with this. Then once we got the data in, what we didn't do, and this is something that I think actually works very well in corporations, is rather than me going and saying, okay, I'm the expert, let me tell you all the things about your organization based on this ONA. What we did is collective meaning making sessions where we first brought leaders together and we looked at the data together and we said, what does this mean? What are the implications of this? What are the actions? We also did that at the regional level. And then we did that with issues. Basically, within their division, they were divided into issues. Um, and then what we did is then applied it in a few different ways. So 
I'm going to share how we actually applied it. So the first thing we did is connected strategies to networks. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit blurry here, but we got the leadership together and looked at four aspects of networks. So networks ability to transfer knowledge, to coordinate, to innovate, and to change. And we said, where are you at today? How well do you do this as an organization? And where do you need to be in the future? And what you can see from the dots is that that third um, scale actually moves quite a bit to the right. They needed a lot more innovation. They also needed uh, a lot more change ability within their organization. So we did that. And then we said, OK, if this is what we need, let's look at what you've got in your organization. And this is just one piece of the organization. I'm not showing you the whole organization because it's um, a lot to take in. But what we saw is a lot of images like this. So you'll see we've got, you know, the routine network, expertise, how do they innovate, how do they solve problems. And mostly we were looking at hub and spoke models like this, you know, one hub in the middle and then the spokes all around uh, with uh, quite a few isolates, people who weren't connected to anyone else. So we looked at these maps and we said, okay, is this gonna get us what we need? And what they said is, and this, for this we used um, uh, an article by Valdis Krebs and June Holly from 2006 where they talk about network evolution. It's been really helpful. And it says that networks evolve from scattered clusters um, and then all the way through core periphery. They were mostly in this second place hub and spoke with some scattered clusters. And what's great about these kinds of um, models is that innovation can happen within the clusters, but it's very hard to make innovation happen within the whole, very hard to make change happen with the whole. And with a hub and spoke, you're dependent, of course, on that one person. So we said, this is where you are. And if you really want innovation and change, you need to go further on down this path to be more of a multi-hub or in some cases, a core periphery model. So then what we did is we put together plans around how to make that happen, how to increase the connections, what kind of connections needed to be increased in order to get us there. So that was the first thing we did. Oh yeah, okay, I forgot, have that nice little animation there. Oh, there we go. All right, lots of animation. So that was the first thing that we did with them. A second thing we did with them is we looked at using the maps to assess talent, risks, and assets. For this one, we started off with the concept of critical connectors. And I'm, I'm jumping over some of these things rather quickly because I'm assuming that this group has some knowledge about these things. Um, critical connectors come up in you know, a lot of different places. Again, I tend to use the model that was developed by uh, Karen Stevenson, um, who did one of the first articles around that. And what we know about critical connectors is that five to 15% of individuals within any network are critical connectors, and then they have disproportionate influence over the whole. Uh, and I'll be curious um, for those of you who are uh, more current, if you think that five to 15% is the right number, the right span, or if you would place that differently. But in any case, what we did is we said, all right, there are critical connectors in the organization, let's look at them. And it was important to do the ONA for this. Just as an aside, a friend of mine who uh, was in a Fortune 500 global information company asked her executives who they thought the top 30 influencers were in the organization. They were like, yep, we got this. Here you go, here's your list, done. And then they did the network analysis. And what they found is that there were only five people who were on both lists. So lesson learned here that executives really only have a line of sight into the people who report to them and perhaps the next level down. So ONA really helps us get more information. So what we did is we shared with leaders in this organization the critical connectors of the organization as a whole and then the critical connectors within each of their areas. And then what we did is we looked at the maps from that perspective. So the leader in charge of the Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa region 
he had a, a major connector, we're going to, I'm going to call her Tosca, who was right in the middle of the expertise network. Everybody went to her. She knew everything there was to know about the organization. She was quite central. And so what we did is we started to play with what ifs. Uh, what if something were to happen to her? And then this is what happens when you take her out of the map. So the leader looked at this. And by the way, what was interesting about this also is that this leader was probably the most skeptical about organization network analysis. He, he was the one I was like, all right, I'll go with it. But this is where he really started to get interested because he saw what happened to his organization without Tosca. I mean, it wasn't a complete disaster, but more scattered clusters, more isolates. And so what he did is he embarked on a conversation with Tosca and an effort that the two of them did together to share her knowledge. Uh, it was actually very welcome for her also because she was quite overwhelmed by all of the people coming to her. So it was a bit of a relief for her. It was also a relief for the leader because about nine months after we had this initial conversation, Tosca got promoted to another part of the organization. And so had that work not been done, then they would have ended up with a map that looked like this, with an organization that looked like this. And because they started to fill the gaps, her loss was not as deep a loss as it might have been otherwise. All right, I'm gonna give you one more piece at Bayer and then we'll stop and we'll you know, check in and see if you've got reactions or questions. Uh, the last thing we did is use the maps to coach leaders. And this is a different leader. She had come to the organization uh, about a year and a half before we did the network analysis. And she had come from a different part of the organization and she was pretty anxious about proving herself um, and um, establishing herself as a leader. So we looked at the expertise network and we looked at where she sat in the network. And so she's right here, 106. And looking at this, we concluded, you know, she concluded in conversation that actually she did a pretty good job. Um, she's not on the periphery. Uh, she is embedded in the network. And most conveniently, she's connected to the hubs in the network, which is a very nice thing to do as a leader, uh, is to work through those hubs rather than trying to manage one-on-one um, -on -one relationships throughout the organization. So she had positioned herself very well. People were coming to her. And, you know, we concluded looking at this that actually, you know, expertise was a thumbs up for her. But what her organization needed to do in the coming two years was actually innovate. They had to come up with new ideas. They had to come up with some breakthrough um, solutions to some difficult challenges. So we then looked at the innovation network. And this is what it looked like. So much less robust than expertise, many fewer conversations happening around innovation. And here she was. So she is much more on the periphery here. And so what this led to was a conversation where she realized that she needed to stop worrying about proving herself and what she needed to start doing was encouraging creativity in the organization. She needed to start connecting people who were thinking in new ways. She needed to bring innovation into the meeting. She needed to create a space where people could fail and have that be accepted in the organization. So let me stop there uh, and pause. Let me look at all of your faces and just, just can see any reactions any questions, anything coming up for you so far? I'd love to know what data you're using for the analysis. What you data? Know, yeah, so, so mm -hmm. are you, yeah, what, what interactions are you measuring when you, when you do these diagrams, yeah. Great. Okay. Yep. So a number of different ones. So, and this was all collected through the online survey. So we do one, which is the resting pulse of the organization. Just who do you work with in order to get your work done? You've also seen the expertise network. So who do you go to when you need expert information related to your job? 
You've also seen the innovation network. So who do you go to when you'd wanna talk about novel um, creative ideas? In addition to that, uh, we also did a problem solving network of who do you go to when you want to improve things in the organization? Um, and then there's, oh, decision-making. Uh, who do you go to when you need a non-routine quick decision made? What was interesting is that we normally also do a social network and that for some of the cultures, uh, you know, some of the places that we were gonna be launching this, that culture, that question felt too invasive and too much of a violation of work-life um, separation. So we did not do that question. Does that answer the question, Andrea? Good, all right, thumbs up. Okay, anything else? I have a question. You mentioned at the very yeah. beginning that, that you do an in-room exercise about the SNA, about how the people are related to each other. Can you talk more yeah. about that? Yes, so that was actually a ton of fun. I love doing this with groups because it makes it real. So what we asked, I, and this was probably about eight years ago, so I'm not gonna remember the exact question, but what we asked them to do is to arrange themselves in the room in relation to the people they work with most frequently. Uh, so what, of course, they did is they clustered themselves by region. Uh, and then I believe we also asked them to arrange themselves according to how central or how peripheral they felt to the divisional network, to the division network. And that was very interesting uh, because there were certain people who put themselves at the middle who people looked at that and said, no, actually, I don't think so. And then there are people who put themselves on the periphery who actually turned out to be critical connectors and very central in the network. So it was an interesting moment of helping folks realize that they didn't have the full picture, that they needed the maps in order to truly understand, get a deeper understanding of the organization. Okay. I have a follow-up question um, related yeah. to that. Um, when you, in that scenario, when you ask people to arrange themselves, did you see much shifting occur? In other words, did you see, see people get up and physically walk around and, and, and reorganize themselves? Um, the reason why I'm yeah. asking that question is because uh, I haven't facilitated a you know in-person meeting in a very long time. Um, but uh, what I used to love to observe is, uh, you know, watching people walk in and sort themselves into their groups uh, at the beginnings of these types of workshops or meetings, um, because it seemed to me like people just uh, tended to gravitate towards those folks that they've worked most closely with, that they trusted, especially when they were walking into a new scenario. So I'm just wondering how much of the, you know, sort of self-sorting was already pre-baked um, prior to that, you know, exercise occurring. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think I think you're right on in that um, people do often sit with the people that they're most comfortable with, that they have close relationships with. Uh, and this group in, in some ways was a little different in that it was the first time in a long time that they had been together uh, with people from around the world. So they, they got together regionally much more often. So with this group, there was a little bit more mixing than you would normally expect because they finally had a chance to sit down next to their colleague in Brussels who they hadn't seen in five years. Um, but that said, when it came time to do the exercise, they actually stood up and moved to a different part of the room. We had a room where there were no tables. And the piece that I always find interesting is that it takes a while for the network to settle because one person will move and then all the folks who feel like they're connected to that person will move in relation to that person. And then each of those people will have, you know, their connectees following them. So it takes a little bit for um, people to get to a place where they can settle and feel like, okay, this is a good representation of the network. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a good question because you, you can see some of the network just in how people naturally sit. 
something that uh, I'm, yeah, something yeah. that I'm very curious about is I usually see case studies with very large organizations. Like I imagine in this case, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but each of the person in the room was some sort of head of department or at least managing their own team mm -hmm. as well. So I'm kind of curious, what do you think is the, the scale at which this becomes very impactful? Or uh, like there's some studies, et cetera, that like even within a small team, you can start to see some patterns, but yeah. feels to me that when we're talking of teams of teams, of teams the, the impact of it just acquires a whole other dimension. And I'm curious about your thoughts in that regard. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so on the team level, I mean, what, what I had always learned is that 13 was the cutoff, is that we don't do this with fewer than 13 people because the math doesn't work. Um, in terms of the, the teams of teams, and, and just to be very clear about my limitations is that I don't work with the 20,000 node networks. Uh, I work much more in the, you know, 100 to 1,000 node networks. So it's a little bit different and a little bit easier for people to wrap their arms around. Um, and could you, could you say more about, Danielle, about your question? Because I'm not sure I quite understand it fully. Well, I mean, it's not a well-defined question, but I'm oh, yeah. thinking when we're talking about innovation, change, um, the the level of lack of communication or communication kind of aggregates yeah. because each person is not a yeah. person, they're a full team. So two teams yeah. not speaking with one another is very different than two people. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe uh, more concretely at the, yeah. at the smaller scales, what sort of insights have you found that that teams found valuable yeah yeah okay um so the piece is, is that we did get all of the data for the whole organization so we didn't just get the leaders we got the teams that they were managing so we had all of that and that actually became very helpful for them so for example we did a session for the um, south american uh group where each of the leaders in South America got to see, first of all, the South American network, but also the networks for their specific teams in their specific countries. And they, I, I think as a leadership tool, and this is the piece that I wish more people, um, more people would, would use it for a leadership development, uh, because the leaders were really excited uh, to have this concrete data about how their organizations were working, around how information was flowing, around how things were getting done, around where the gaps were in their organizations. So, and the other piece that I found really exciting in terms of the leadership coaching aspect is that it allowed conversations that are sometimes hard to have. So this wasn't around you are, a bad leader or you're falling down in this way, it's let's look at the data together and look at what kind of leadership your network needs from you. What parts of this network need your, your intervention? So it was a way to give people a little bit of distance and also think about how they, uh, they could shift in relation to their networks. So I really like using it at a small scale as well as a large scale. Thank you very much. Are okay. there, mm -hmm. um, sorry, quick quick thing, just yeah, uh, sure. are there any particular resources that you would recommend related to the leadership piece? Um, yes, yes, I can send those. Um, please, if you if you wouldn't mind, yeah. uh, I'll make sure to distribute them to the others as well. In, uh, okay. the yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great, my pleasure. Yeah, and the other things that I found very helpful is the Valdis and Holly article from 2006, which does network um, evolution. Organizations tend to get that. It helps them make sense of these maps. And then uh, I also really like Ron Burt did a study on network learning for leadership. And he's got some very concrete data about the difference between 
a, a group of people who learned about networks and started to think in network ways versus a group of leaders that didn't. And the group of leaders that did learn had tremendous gains in terms of promotions, um, in terms of performance evaluation, whereas the other group um, was more stable. So it's a nice, concrete example of the good that learning about networks can do. So let me show you probably just one more example given our time. Um, this is the National Bra Braille Press. So National Braille Press is uh, an American organization. They're based in Boston. And what they do is they make books for in Braille, uh, mostly for children. And when I connected with them, they had a new CEO, their long-term CEO had been in place for 31 years, a new person came on. And when he came in, he found a lot of challenges. So people weren't collaborating in the organization. There were missed opportunities. So um, fundraising opportunities that just fell through the cracks. There was a mismatch between people and jobs. So he did a lot of things in his first eight months on the job. He restructured the organization. He redesigned departments. Uh, some employees were asked to leave. Others were promoted. And what he wanted to know is, is it working? All these things I'm doing, is this having the impact I want it to have? So this was a different kind of network analysis that we did. And um, Andrea, here you'll see the questions. So you'd asked before about the questions. Uh, the first thing we did uh, is look at the organization as a whole. And in this visualization, uh, the different departments are separated. So starting at 12 o'clock, we have the admin department, which included the executive director, development, educational sales, production, publication services, and systems. And so the resting pulse, um, sometimes what we call this you know, basic work network, showed that things were happening. You know, so this is, this is a healthy, alive organization with a lot of interactions. However, then we started to drill down. And when we looked at the expertise network, what became clear is that people in the organization, strangely enough, were doing more exchange across divisions than within divisions. Now, this is, this is unusual. Usually we see the flip side uh, and that people have usually quite strong relationships within their divisions, less so uh, between divisions. So in some ways, this was positive in that we are getting some cross-functional expertise flow. But what it also spoke to is that this, um, the redesign hadn't quite gelled yet. People weren't yet really connecting with their colleagues in their new divisions or their new departments. So there was an item that needed to be done there to build the teams internally. Another thing we looked at, at this one, we were able to look at the social network and there was not a lot of activity within most departments. And it tends to be the same people connecting over and over again. And by the way, these are all the, the confirmed connections. And this was worrying because at least you know, when I look at the social network, what I think about is, does this organization have the shock absorbers it needs to manage stress and manage change? Because that's what the social network does. When there's some sort of shock to the system, people go to folks they feel comfortable with. And what the conclusion was here from conversations with leaders from others in the organization is that the people were in shock um, that the having people leave be dismissed after that not happening for 30 years was a challenge. Uh, the redesign was a challenge. And there was, uh, people had really um, retreated back into themselves. So one of the learnings for the leadership team is that they needed to have some time to um, relax a little bit together to encourage people to connect. They needed to have some lunches, some dinners. They needed to have some fun. This was an organization where people were not having very much fun. And they needed that not just for the sake of fun itself, but because there was a risk in this organization uh, and that it would not have what it needed in times of stress if those relationships did not already exist. 
So that's a little bit on National Braille Press. And actually looking at the time, we might have time to do one more. Let me give you one. Do we have, what do you think, Daniel? I'm looking at you. Yeah. Do you time I, for one more, would you rather pause and talk? Um, yeah, let me see, unless someone has a burning question, I think it would be fantastic to hear another one. And yeah, if anyone has a burning question, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, it's on the reactions button at the bottom. You can just go like this. Yeah. Um, just going to give a moment to see if anybody has anything. OK, so then, great. So a question for you. Um, you have two options. The first option is looking at using networks in a community, a town in Texas. And the other one is using networks in a biopharmaceutical women's network. So who would like to hear about the town? Can I see some hands? All right, who would like to hear about the biopharma? Okay, all right, biopharma it is. So hold on a moment. I'm going to flip really quickly through a bunch of slides. So don't get um, overwhelmed here. I'm going to get through that. OK, here we go. This is the Women's Success Network. So this is a pseudonym. Um, I have published about these folks. Um, there's an article in Strategy and Business that I can share with you. But they did not want the name of their organization shared. But this was a biopharmaceutical company. And they had an internal uh, employee resource group. So, and they had a few of them. They had one for um, LGBTQ staff. They had one for um, people of color. They had a special one for Latino, Latina uh, veterans. So they had a number of different ones. And this was the Women's Success Network. And what they were interested in, uh, the Women's Success Network, is helping women grow and become promoted in the company. So what they noticed is that there was pretty much a 50-50 split of women and men uh, at lower levels in the organization, but the further up you got in the organization, the fewer uh, women were in positions of leadership. So this network was designed to do that and designed to give women support in the hard sciences. The company was very focused on metrics, and so they needed to provide some concrete evidence that what they were doing was successful. So what was lovely about this particular uh, project is that this was a two-year project. So we got a snapshot in 2013 and a snapshot in 2014. So this is what their network looked like in 2013. And this is what it looked like in 2014. So what the first thing they were able to say is we had tremendous growth, uh, which was helpful. That was part of the message that they wanted to send. But then we started to get a little bit deeper. So here's, you, you can see more of the growth from 343 people to 634 people. Um, and then the other thing that we looked at was the density. So in 2013, smaller network, fewer possible connections, but in 2014, more possible connections. Then what we looked at is expertise, because one of the things they were very interested in is they wanted to help women uh, form connections within the organization. And you know, they noticed that the, that the men tended to have a network where you know, they would share information with each other, the, you know, they could go to each other, uh, and they wanted to see if women were exchanging expertise in the same way. And during the 12 months prior to the second ONA, they had a lot of activities designed to encourage expertise sharing within the network. And what they saw is that there was a lot more growth uh, within the network. Twice as many were sought for expertise in 2014 as 2013. And there were more average connections per person. So it went from 2.68 connections in 2013 to 4.22 connections in 2014. The other thing that they were very interested in is mentoring. Uh, because again, what they wanted is they wanted women to be shepherded up through the levels in the organization. So we were able to see that in 2013, uh, there were 43 people in the network who were seeking mentoring. 
in 2014, there were 76. Uh, the group of people who were being sought after went from 68 to 173. And this was actually very important for the organization because what they had talked about is that the same small group of women tended to be overburdened with mentoring. And so what they needed is they needed a broader group of women who were willing to serve as mentors. And that is what they found is that there were more people available for mentoring. We looked at the average degrees in the mentoring network and those changed as well between 2013 and 2014. And then finally, um, how does mentoring work? We noticed that newbies, so people who had been in the organization for zero to three years, were more likely to seek mentoring relationships with experienced staffers in 2014 and 2013. So this is the mentoring network. The green nodes are newcomers to the organization and the blue nodes have been there four plus years. Uh, there may be a few grays in there. Those are people who did not fill out that particular demographic information. And so what we saw in 2014 is there was a much more mix of blues and greens than there were in previous years. And then the last thing we were able to do through this network is analysis is to look at who was mentoring whom. Uh, and there were some interesting pieces here. So, uh, and how their levels worked one to five or more entry level, uh, the 13 plus were executive level. And interestingly, the people who were in their early um, career, not newbies, but still, you know, fairly early on in their careers in level six or nine, were mostly getting mentoring within their level. And this was flagged as a major issue. And that for these folks to get to levels 10 through 12, they needed more senior mentors in the organization. And so this network put together programs designed to match uh, people in six through nine with levels 10 through 12. And you can see some of the other dynamics that were happening there as well. But this was a really nice match overall for this organization because their day-to-day -day business, they were looking at numbers, uh, they're looking at science. And so for them to say, we're having good experiences in our women's support network wasn't enough. They needed some hard concrete data to make the case that this group was working well and was generating results. So I think that's what I've got. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share now. And I'm curious if folks have questions and what I'm really curious about is how this relates to your work. I know that you all do all sorts of different things. And I know this may not be a direct match, but I'm curious if this gives you any ideas um, or thoughts about how you might apply some of these ideas in the work you do. Thank you, Maya, for, for this talk. Um, I definitely have one idea I'm going to bring up later on to my team. I uh, might mention it here also if, if nobody, uh, if there's time. Um, I was wondering, like, at the beginning, you talked about critical connectors, and we all view it from different lenses and using different metrics for it. Could you speak yeah. a bit more about how do you define it and measure it? Yeah, so I'm using Karen Stevenson's work, uh, and I can send you the data, the article with the math in it. And she has the hub gatekeeper pulse taker model. Um, so it's basically, you know, the hubs are, you know, centrality, and then she is looking at um, between this and closeness. Um, and so, you know, those are relatively straightforward uh, calculations. And I work with those. I mean, there's a lot of others, um, you know, the, the bridging um, and the brokering is good language, uh, but I like the hubs, gatekeepers and pulse takers because people tend to intuitively understand it in organizations. So, so I mostly stuck with that and occasionally bringing in a few others. So I'll pass the article along so you can see the math. And what I will tell you is that, um, 
is that I let mostly the um, the software do the math for me. I'm not a math person. So if you want to geek out on the equations, then uh, there's there's someone else, someone else out there for you to geek out with. It won't be me. Hey, go ahead. I see a hand raised. Yeah. Hi, thank you for this presentation, uh, Maya. So in I want to talk about the previous uh, case study. You mentioned the need for fun, to introduce fun. And I have three questions. Mm -hmm. First, have you, have you seen this need in other instances as well? Second, mm -hmm. why was fun important? And third, how did you introduce fun? I mean, what was the solution to yeah. the problem? Yeah. Yeah, good questions. Good questions. So the reason for fun is that this organization, the people in the organization had really uh, turned into themselves. They had become isolated. They had gotten to a place where they were coming in, they were doing their jobs, they were going home. And there needed to be a little bit more ease so that they could feel comfortable talking about tough issues so that they could uh, express their opinions. They could say sometimes the controversial things that might need to be said. And for them to feel more comfortable doing that, they needed to have some more relationships with each other. And we, uh, we got to fun partially because this organization used to have a culture of fun. Uh, and in the transition from the old CEO to the new CEO, that fun had been lost. So it was about awakening what had been in the organization, but had been neglected. So it was something they wanted. And I actually was not involved in creating the fun. <laughs> I think they, they did that. But I think what they started with is they started with lunches uh, and they started with gatherings um, so that, you know, they would treat people and have some sort of fun activity to do together to encourage people to remember that work just didn't need to be a slog all the time, um, that they could they could enjoy each other's presence. Yeah. Have you seen that this is a problem with other organizations as well? Yes, yes, particularly organizations that are post some sort of intense or traumatic event. Um, so um, an intense reorganization, for example, um, can sometimes do it. Um, some scandals in the organization, uh, toxicity in the organization where there's a, a toxic environment, a toxic leader. Uh, in those cases, yes, the social network can get very sparse. And that is always worrisome because you know, we're primates, we're social creatures. And if we don't have social connections, then it does start to affect performance. Uh, and the quality of the work. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Maya. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. All right, I see Andrea and then Kibo and then Serbi. Cool. Um, so one of those sort of inherent characteristics of systems is that the feedback loops mean that change isn't predictable. Um, yeah. And I'm curious about um, mechanisms of change that you see the actually changing the network um, and what kind yeah. of things you try to change and the network sort of reasserts itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so so true. Um, also because this is one of the things that I, I really love talking to leaders about is that they often do reorganizations and think, you know, they you know redraw the boxes, they say, okay, we are reorganized and then are wondering why it hasn't had the expected results. And it's because they haven't shifted the networks. So in doing these reorganizations, I think what's really important is to look actually at the critical connectors and look at, okay, we're going from, you know, these boxes to these boxes and these new boxes need to talk to each other. Who are the critical connectors within each box? And let's get them working together. Let's put them on a, a joint team, give them joint goals. So put something structural in to encourage that collaboration. And it tends to work best at the critical connector level because they're so connected that they tend to bring people along with them. So it's a nice shortcut uh, for making change is working with 
the people who have disproportionate influence, and then you get the ripple effect. Uh, but I think the piece there is not just a, you two go have lunch together, um, but it's a, you know, let, let's put something concrete where folks uh, have a goal, have a shared goal that they need to work towards. Awesome. Interesting. How does that match your experience, Andrea? Does that ring true for with what you've seen? Yes, absolutely. Especially that shared goal thing I thought was, yeah. was an interesting mm -hmm. element. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. Kibo, what are you thinking? I'm wondering about the correlation between critical connectors and overload or um, yep. being stretched too thin, um, particularly because the one time that I've done this, uh, something similar to this, it wasn't this exactly, but it was something similar. It was something that uh, we backed into as a result of trying to identify people who were overloaded. Um, mm -hmm. and we started with the assumption that the folks who were overloaded, well, actually taking it one step backwards, we were looking for bottlenecks and yeah. we started with bottlenecks, um, and from there decided that one interesting area of exploration would be, um, that bottlenecks are caused potentially by people who are overloaded. And then from there looked at, um, the what we call the social work that people were undertaking who were overloaded and we found that you know it, it tracked pretty well from you know from one assumption to another again there were just assumptions that we worked from yeah. but it, it seemed to track really well and uh, what we used uh, was actually um, internal messaging tools to figure out mm -hmm. because this organization would spin up a new you know, chat channel or a new working group or something like that on a social, you know, on a, on a uh, communication platform. So we were able to get some, you know, sort of uh, quantitative data about people's contributions and numbers of groups that they were involved in and all of that stuff. But um, it, it just struck me that, you know, you made that comment earlier about like sort of the usual suspects um, and how those folks, um, you know, end up you know, being so critical to success in an organization, but also being the ones that are the most vulnerable yeah. or the organizations around them immediately are the most vulnerable to, you know, um, them leaving or something yeah. like that. So I was just wondering how that relates to your experience. Yeah, no, I think that very much relates to my experience. And I think um, what it makes me think of is if you remember that slide with the two columns, one with who the leaders thought the influencers were and who the actual influencers are, um, what the leaders were doing is they were consistently going to the same 30 people over and over and over again. And of course, those people were starting to feel overwhelmed. But what they weren't doing is they weren't seeing the other critical connectors in the organization, some of whom who were not overloaded. And so I think there is that correlation um, sometimes between uh, being a critical connector and being overloaded. And then sometimes there isn't uh, because those folks are overlooked. Uh, and going down uh, beyond the usual suspects to the next group can often be really helpful uh, because sometimes they'll touch different populations. Um, they'll have different points of view. And um, let me just, oh, I suspect that one of the causes of overload of critical connectors is that this kind of work isn't measured or valued performance review. Yeah, exactly. And what it was just making me think of is I did one of these uh, with the city government and showed the leaders their list of critical connectors and they were shocked to find out that this fairly quiet man uh, who was an entry level employee in an entry level position was one of the major critical correctors in the organization. And he wasn't showy, but he had a reputation for getting things done and solving problems. And this is one of the things I love about using critical connectors is that it also can um, bring attention to those folks who are doing amazing work and who aren't recognized for it because they're not showy, because they don't have a title um, that people expect uh, from an influencer. So uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I entirely, oh good, I got a heart there from Kibo. Thank you for that. 
Um, and I notice we're a little short on time and I wanna make sure that we have a chance for Serby who's been waiting to get her voice in. Yeah, I have a real uh, quick question. Have you done this since people have been working remotely and have any results shifted or changed? Because I imagine this would be really helpful mm -hmm. for folks who are remote and hybrid because yeah. you just don't see each other all the time. And so even yeah. your sight lines into what you thought you could see when people are yeah. co-located might not be. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And what I will say is that most of the studies I've always done have been with people who are not co-located. So buyer, you know, we were working with multiple locations um, with the women's pharma, um, again, multiple locations. So I do think that it is a great thing to do. And the other thing that I didn't show you in the Wimberley one is that then you can also use networks to help find matches. So with the, the and Wimberley, that was the town in Texas I mentioned. So what you can also do is use it to find the people who, for example, have that area of expertise that you might need. Um, so I think great, great potential for using networks in remote workplaces to help people find the folks that they need and see how they fit into a larger whole. So, Lots to be explored there. And uh, I think we're just about at time, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all do with this. I know RN Diao is doing some fantastic and interesting work. So uh, I hope this has been helpful and, you know, spurred some ideas for you.